Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Heise Mullerman, the CEO and founder of Sensorfy. They are an all-in-one partner to help companies get started with predictive maintenance. Good conversation. We talk a lot about industrial OEM companies and how they should embrace a serialization strategy. We talk about how IoT and predictive maintenance can enable this. Give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you're not done so already, and hit that bell icon so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're out. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode. Uh, but before we get into it, we have a quick word from our sponsor. The We Talk IoT Business Podcast is back. Explore best practices, IoT use cases, and formulas for success on your preferred stream provider or visit avnet-silica.com slash podcast. That's the We Talk IoT Internet of Things Business Podcast. If you want to check it out on the website, it's www.avnet, A-V-N-E-T dash silica, S-I-L-I-C-A dot com slash podcast. Welcome, Heist, the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. I'm uh, glad to be on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, let's kick us off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself uh, and the company to our audience. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, so my name is uh, is Gijs Meuleman. I'm a uh, uh, an engineer, background in en- electronic engineering from uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, I uh, I started in uh, the field of IoT. Uh, after I finished my uh, my graduation uh, project in 2012, at the moment uh, IoT was still relatively new, um, and um, yeah, from there we uh, we started and we implemented various uh, IoT solutions. So Sensorfy is uh, is is active in um, the field of uh, predictive maintenance. So we help uh, we help mainly uh, industrial OEM companies by integrating our IoT solutions into their equipment or assets. Uh, it's a, uh, a full stack solution, so including hardware sensors, softwares, and uh, and also, of course, data analysis. We've actually had a few conversations in the past about predictive maintenance, but can you just high level it for our audience, just for those maybe who be a little unfamiliar, or I guess talk about where predictive maintenance is now when it comes to the IoT space. So, uh, so, so what's predictive maintenance? Uh, is is um, at least what, what we do is we, we build smart sensor technology that can predict uh, technical failure. Uh, and in that way, we eliminate unplanned downtime and also uh, lengthen the lifetime of assets. Uh, mainly, um, mainly important when, um, when you have, when you have yeah, expensive assets that uh, if, you, if you detect a failure upfront, then you can uh, usually prevent, prevent it from, uh, from really breaking down. One thing I wanted to ask you is when we're talking about kind of the industrial space, this is where predictive maintenance obviously gets, gets talked about a lot. Um, what is what is the current kind of model that OEMs and in, or industrial OEMs, I should say, are kind of taking right now when it comes to selling their products, selling their offering, and things like that? Because I feel like from what I want to get into is kind of if there are other better approaches to to kind of doing business. But just like I guess to set the stage, how are industrial OEMs right now selling their products? From a, like how what's the strategy that they're using that they're taking right now? Yeah, very good question. So what, what you typically see in in the industrial uh, OEM space is that they a certain OEM produces an asset and uh, sells that uh, to their customers, so called asset owners, and that's usually very transactional in the sense that they they've built an asset, a type of equipment, um, and uh, once it's manufactured, they sell it to the customer. And they start using uh, this equipment. Uh, once it, it breaks down, they they might might still order some service, but after the after after the, the equipment um, yeah reaches the end of the lifetime, then they usually buy again, which generates another transaction. And is there with IoT and everything that's kind of out there now? It sounds like there may be different ways to approach this, or maybe even better ways to, to kind of go about this. And if so. From your perspective, what are those ways? If you could kind of talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So uh, what you see that uh, it's a trend, actually, uh, OEMs are investigating and, and uh, some are already uh, very far and other are just, many are just starting, is uh, selling their product more as a, as a service. Because a customer buys a piece of equipment um, because it can do something. And uh, if you as an OEM can guarantee the outcome of what the equipment does, 
then uh, you might even consider not selling the equipment itself, but saying, okay, I guarantee for a certain period that the uh, equipment functions as expected. Uh, one of the challenges you face then as an OEMer is that you actually don't know that much about how the equipment is used in the field. So if you want to, uh, want to pursue this strategy, which is also very, uh, very interesting for, for businesses, because if you sell something as a service, you have a, a recurring re revenue model, which increases the valuation of your company. The uh, recurring revenue, um, yeah, generating businesses are, are valued much higher. Um, but you need to know how your, how your equipment's, how it's being used. And if it's all, if it's almost breaking down. So that's where sensors come in place, uh, usually IOT sensors. And that's something uh, we're quite familiar with. And we help customers integrate those sensors so they can actually see um, how their equipment is being used and uh, when they need to intervene. So that would be for for the, the OEMs to be able to monitor and track their equipment. Or is that for the end user that's basically buying or bringing these pieces of equipment in and engaging with it? Or both? It, it's actually both. Uh, the, the the main benefit, of course, is with the uh, is with what we call the asset owner, which buys from the original equipment manufacturer. So, uh, for example, uh, well, one of our customers makes uh, railway switches, and uh, that's usually a very transactional business. Sell a, a railway switch to a, a railway company, uh, uh, but if you can guarantee and say, okay, now it's going to break down, it's almost going to break down, then uh, you might might understand that the, the asset owner is can, can benefit a lot from that because unplanned downtime is a very costly uh, event. And the moment you can predict that, that's, uh, yeah, that's very beneficial for the asset owner, which means that the original equipment manufacturer can also uh, charge a fee for that. So, so let me ask then, um, kind of going from selling their product in a more transactional way to the product as a service, kind of outcome as a service in a sense, it sounds like. How how would an OEM, I guess, how challenging is it for an OEM to go about doing that? Um, why would they do that? Um, and are there kind of risks associated with it from, you know, the years of doing business the way that they've been doing business? Yeah, it, it's a, uh, quite some challenges involved, as you might expect. Uh, one of the things is that uh, as a from, from a sales perspective, uh, usually the, uh, uh, the, the the sales department is rewarded for a transaction. Uh, if you sell a service, then uh, it's usually a small fee. So so there there is some kind of um, tra trade off there. You need to educate your 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 staff on on how to how to sell a service instead of a of a, of a piece of equipment. Uh, but before that, you actually need to uh, need to figure out. What are the important things you want to monitor? What do you want to know about your equipment in the field? Uh, what are the typical failure modes in your equipment? So what can go wrong? And is it possible to capture those? Uh, and how difficult is it to capture those moments? Uh, and that's where we come in. We provide the technology, uh, the, the, the various sensors, and also help uh, developing the right algorithm. Right, no, that's fantastic. So then if I guess if we go to the other end of that from the challenges to once it's implemented, what are the real benefits of a company going to the servitization strategy um, around, you know, I'm sure there's increased value for, for end customers, there's a more effective use of resources, effective use of resources, things like that. But what are like the full scope of benefits that these companies are now looking into or I guess now realizing that this is something that we should strongly be considering? Multiple cases why, why this is beneficial for, for OAMs. So one of the things is um, if, you're, if you're a service-based business, then uh, you usually get paid from the OPEX part of, a, uh, of an asset owner, which means it's very stable because they need your solution and uh, this goes on, uh, well, doesn't matter what the economic conditions are because they just need the solution. In case you're a uh, purely transactional business, what you typically see is that especially during an economic downturn is that uh, companies, asset owners, just delay their, uh, their investments. So uh, it's, it's, your, your business is, is, is less stable. It's one of the, it's one of the, the, one of the key benefits of a, of a recurring revenue model. Um, of course, 
The other thing is uh, if you can uh, can figure out first, as in in your industry, on how you how you can monitor uh, and uh, detect a technical failure upfront, then you can be like, you can differentiate yourself from the competition. And uh, it's like a, a the more usually it's like the more data you have, the more access you have to data, is that the faster you learn. And uh, the the faster you can uh, you, you can add value to your uh, to, to your clients. So um, if you're first, then you can end up uh, like a winner in your industry and take a lot of market share. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's such an interesting way to think about it because you know from just historical perspective, thinking about how OEMs usually sell into companies, like you mentioned, it's very transactional. But there's it's it's so it's interesting to really think about how you can kind of really shift an entire way of doing business with the help of IoT to um, make this plausible and make this beneficial ideally to both sides um, at the end of the day, which is super interesting. Um, what are you seeing so from your conversations or your engagement in the industry with OEMs and the, the end buyers, what are you seeing um, or I guess how far along are we kind of in this process and being able to make this model successful like are you seeing a lot of companies implement it it's still pretty early on in companies getting to the ability to do that because i know it probably changes some things internally but where kind of are we in in that journey yeah so so what i see there is a a huge variation in uh, to to be honest uh, much mm, most most industrial companies uh, original equipment manufacturers are in the beginning they're starting to to see the benefits of this of this uh, of this strategy uh, they're exploring, they're doing some proof of concept, see uh, what they yeah to validate to validate the business case, and then there are uh, like a few front runners that have fully implemented certification. They're fully outcome based, almost fully outcome based, and then uh, there's everything in between, like uh, where you still sell as a transaction. And then sell this as an additional service, for example. And and usually it, it's it's a journey. You don't do it in a, it's it's not a, the flip of a switch. You say, okay, today I'm I'm transactional, and and the next moment I'm I'm fully outcome based. Yeah, no, it sounds like there's a lot of things that need to be adjusted, thought about, kind of re- reorganized in order to make this viable, and also for probably existing customers because the model has always been transactional. So how do you, you know, kind of articulate this to them, the value on both sides, so that the way they're doing business. For, um, benefits and can fit in with this as well as the way the OEMs are selling into these companies. It starts with a just a, a added service. So there's still transactional business model and I say, okay, if you add some sensors to this, then we can predict this, this, and this type of failure and uh, we can inform you in time to do X, Y, or Z. And then from there, they they they, they develop their strategy so you can, can capture more and more failure modes and then eventually uh, completely uh, or, or partially uh, go to outcome-based business model. Yeah, it sounds like it could be something a little bit of a hybrid approach, depending on how they do things and how their customers want to engage with them. So um, giving them the option is very interesting for sure. Um, so let, let me let me pivot away from this just slightly and ask you some questions about, because um, we've been talking about business case, which I think is a really interesting topic. But if you if you were to remove out of just kind of what we're talking about here with OEMs and transactional versus more of the um, kind of outcome-based relationships and business models. How, how could a company, just generally speaking, be thinking about when it comes to an IoT solution, shaping their business case and kind of moving through that you know early stages of digitization to kind of more mature stages of it by that business case kind of evolving? Because I think it's always a challenge for companies is to be able to justify and understand how the business benefits from the implementation of an IoT solution or other digital transformation initiatives and things like that. But how do you think about it? How do how are you kind of seeing companies shape their business case in order to keep moving down that path? Yeah. So so what I see is is when when a company starts doing this, it's uh, it's usually a yeah. Well, it, that, that there has to be a, a management buy-in, of course. Saying, hey, this is something uh, we, we really need to pursue, we need to look into. Uh, usually, if you, if you want to implement predictive maintenance, then you're going, to, you're going to take a look and say, okay, how is my asset performing? 
what are the typical failure modes I have uh, in my asset. And then uh, usually have a conversation with, with like uh, people from the operations, uh, from service. Uh, you have some, some technology provider like us uh, have, uh, have multiple brainstorm sessions. See, okay, what is there? What, what's that possible that we can measure? Where can we add value? Um, you go to customers, validate these, uh, validate these IDs. Say, okay, if we can measure this and this, how, how does that benefit you? And from there, you, uh, you, you start creating a concept and say, okay, this is something, uh, if, if we can measure this, then this might be beneficial. Um, well, then the, the, the typical next step is that a, a company starts with a uh, so-called proof of concept where we install some of the technology, usually based on more, more or less mature building blocks. So you don't, you don't have to develop a lot of, uh, or, or yeah, do a lot of development. And then really validate if these uh, that use cases you think about really provide the, the value you're, you're looking after. Uh, the moment uh, you validate that, I say, usually this, this can take like weeks to months to, to sometimes uh, even a year um, to, to do this. Uh, once you've you know, just identified uh, the, the typical steps and the tip, well, what, what kind of use cases you want to cover, then you can really look at, okay, how, how are we going to industrialize this? How, how are we going to make a, a solution that's scalable for almost every asset? Um, well, and that's, that, that takes yeah, also quite some time, depending on the complexity of the, uh, of the IoT product, for example. Uh, one, then you deploy some of your sensors in the field, and uh, then the, the, the most interesting part starts is, uh, is gathering all the data and, uh, and making the, the correct algorithms, which depending on the, on the complexity of your equipment and the failure mode you want to, want to capture, can, can, can take three months to a year. Absolutely. And, and then as you kind of move that into, you know, a fried, once you get through the business case side, there's obviously technical challenge that comes from the implementation of all this and just thinking through it, planning and all the good things that kind of go into this whole process. Um, what are some of those challenges that, that you're seeing and how can companies kind of approach those technical challenges when it comes to um, you know, trying to move further down the path of digital transformation? Yeah, so, so, so there are multiple. Eh? You need to look at the, uh, at, at, at the pricing, of course. Uh, the technical challenges we typically face is, is how do we ensure that, it's, that, 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 uh, that, that the IoT solution works for, the, for, for uh, a, a long period of time? Usually battery, so, so low power operation is, is, is a typical, uh, typical thing we need to address. Reliable wireless communication is another, quite another thing. Uh, but that's something yeah, we, we deal with every day. So uh, it's wise to, uh, yeah, to select a good partner. It's interesting because you know, with, diff- with new connectivity, connectivity technologies that come out on a regular basis and new use cases that are you know, imagined up, built, kind of rolled out, um, the connectivity is something that finding that perfect match is always, is always can always be, can, can oftentimes be a challenge, I guess I should say. Um, but the nice thing is there's lots of options. There's lots of different ways to find the right connectivity that works for your use case without overkill from a cost standpoint, bandwidth standpoint, just, you know, what do you really need to do it? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 When I started in 2015, there was, uh, were only a few, but, uh, but over the years, the, uh, the options have, uh, have increased a lot. And it's selecting the right, uh, yeah, the right, the right connectivity for your application, which is key, of course. Yeah, I definitely think it's important for companies that are listening to this or looking to kind of bring in IoT solutions um, to move down that that digital transformation journey. Um, once you've established the business case, to really talk with companies who specialize in what you're looking to build. I think trying to go horizontal with a company is not always easy. Or go to a company that is more horizontal focused is not is not always easy. But for the companies who have who specialize and really understand your space and have built solutions with your end users and your problems in mind, I think is a really important way to be approaching that decision making process when it comes to trying to get over those technical challenges that we're talking about. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, but this is a uh, been a really cool conversation. We haven't actually talked about um, kind of industrial OEMs much and kind of how they do things. I think it's just historically been like oh they just you know they sell their their, their equipment and that's kind of how it's done but with IOT and sensors and collecting data in different ways there's just so much that that, in op- that opens up not just for the end user to benefit but also for 
the the OEMs themselves. So I really appreciate you kind of coming on and talking about your perspective in this, on this kind of topic, how predictive maintenance is um, playing a role here as well, and what you all do for the industry. It's been it's been a great conversation. So so I thank you uh, for your time. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Um, for our audience who wants to learn more about what you all have going on and maybe follow up on this conversation, any questions, any topics, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, so the best way is to, to, to go to our website, www.sensorfy.ai, and fill in the contact form, and then uh, we'll be in contact shortly. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it, and excited to get this out to our audience. Thank you very much. Have a great day.